Good morning, everybody. My name is David Sandalo. I'm the inaugural fellow here at the Center on Global Energy Policy, and I am delighted uh, to welcome to Columbia today Hemi Bahar from the International Energy, Energy Agency uh, on the occasion of the release of the Medium-Term Renewable Energy Market Report by the IEA. Uh, this event, uh, like all of the Center on Global Energy Policy's events, is being webcast live. For those of you watching on the web, you can uh, participate in the conversation later by sending us questions at uh, use hashtag CGEP events, the Center on Global Energy Policy events, so hashtag CGEP events. Uh, and you can follow us on Twitter um, at uh, Columbia U Energy. Um, uh, our speaker today has a uh, distinguished background in the topic he's going to be speaking on. He is um, project manager uh, at the IEA. Um, before that, he worked as a trade policy analyst at the Organization for uh, uh, Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD, analyzing uh, renewable energy and trade. Um, he's worked on cross-border trade and electricity and uh, worked at the World Bank um, on a variety of topics. He holds a degree from Sabansi University and a master's degree from John Hopkins Sice. Um, delighted to welcome Jaime, who will give us a presentation on the IEA's medium-term uh, renewable energy market report, and then we'll have a dialogue and then bring in all of you. Thanks, Jaime. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for the invitation. Um, before I start, I would like to give a little bit of a context uh, where IEA is going. Uh, because it actually relates to what I'm going to present. Um, when our f new executive director uh, took uh, its position one year ago, he basically based IEA's new strategy on three pillars. The first one was the opening doors uh, of the IEA to emerging economies. Uh, last week, uh, we were in Singapore, and then Singapore just became an association member of the IEA. Um, the second pillar was the strengthening and broadening energy security uh, issues that IEA is dealing with. It used to be based on oil. Now we are working on electricity security and gas security. Um, and to establish IEA as an international hub for clean energy and energy efficiency. So our renewables work, including this report, uh, is touching all the issues that is uh, related to these three pillars. Uh, which I will touch upon during my uh, presentation. So I'd like to give a little bit of a context before I start to uh, present uh, the, new, the results of the report. So when we published this report, uh, one of the main headlines was that renewables had a record capacity. Yes, but this record capacity actually included other records uh, in it. So the first one was 153 gigawatts of renewables were installed in 2015, a record capacity. Uh, it was, this is accompanied by about 66 gigawatt of new wind additions, which was a record on its own, 49 gigawatts of solar PV additions, which was a record on its own. And another important thing, for the first time, renewables additions represented more than half of global capacity additions in electricity. This was the first time. And the last but not least, uh, in terms of cumulative capacity, now renewables overtook coal as of 2015. Obviously, in terms of generation, coal still generates the majority of uh, capacity, uh, gener uh, electricity in the world, which is about uh, 40%. Renewables is the second, and gas is the third. It took about eight years to nine years to ratify Kyoto Protocol, uh, and it took about less than a year to ratify, which will be ratified in, in a few days from now, uh, the Paris Agreement. So this, this was an historical achievement, and we saw a policy momentum uh, around COP21. Why do I say around COP21, but not after COP21? Because all the preparation going towards COP21, such as INDCs, now they are called NDCs, is, has created a policy momentum which positively affected uh, renewable deployment globally and which will affect, which I will uh, give a couple of examples in my presentation. However, climate change mitigation is only one part of the story and one driver uh, for renewables. There are also other drivers, especially in Asia, such as uh, local air pollution 
and energy security concerns. So our investment report, which we published in September, showed a clear shift of investment uh, from fossil fuels to renewables. While fossil fuel investments uh, declined, uh, renewable investments uh, were stable in 2015. Uh, it represented about 20% of global energy investment, which was about 1.8 trillion. Secondly, we have to be aware that the goals that we agreed in Paris are actually more ambitious than what we stand right now. Uh, and uh, policy remains an important part of the, of the renewable energy, uh, energy world. And it will be uh, in the future, in, at least in the short term future and medium term future. And we really need to heighten uh, our uh, commitment to renewables in, if you want to go towards a two degree scenario. Last year here, we presented the bar on the left uh, in terms of our forecast. This is our last year's forecast. We, we basically forecasted about 710 gigawatts of renewable capacity in the coming five years. Uh, this year, we improved our forecast by 13%. Uh, this is mainly due to uh, several policy changes in key markets. These include the United States, the multi-year extension of the production and investment tax credit, which has led uh, about 60% uh, more capacity growth in the US in our forecast. Uh, China, the second largest uh, revisions, uh, which is due to China's new 13-year uh, economic plan and its indicative targets for wind and solar, which were increased. Uh, and the third, India, uh, because we improved our forecast slightly as the better implementation of the federal policies at the state level and uh, several other improvements, especially on the cost side. China remains the key market uh, for the renewable capacity growth going forward. It represents about 40% of all renewable additions in coming five years. However, the most important change in our forecast is that US, for the first time, will take over, in terms of capacity additions, European Union. Uh, this is a historical uh, uh, thing that we are expecting. Uh, this is mainly due to European additions are going down, while US new ex tax extension will push the capacity up in the United States, which I will show later on the details. So let's put things in a little bit into context. Uh, so we basically, in order to understand who is growing faster uh, in terms of the energy source uh, in the electricity sector, we basically looked at the global power generation and indexed it to 2001 in order to see the growth. And you, as you can see in this chart, uh, global power generation will continue to grow, um, which will be driven mostly uh, the growth coming from Asia, uh, particularly in Southeast Asia, India, and China, while OECD countries the, the electricity demand growth will be almost flat. When we look at two major fuels, how they will develop over the medium term, uh, as you can see in 2015, there was a decline in coal generation. Uh, this is due to China. And there was an increase in gas generation, and this was due to the United States and few other places where uh, gas prices were significantly lower than before, which pushed up the, the generation. Over the medium term, for the first time, growth of coal generation will be below, for the first time, below uh, the gas generation uh, growth, uh, sorry, electricity generation growth. And we will see a slightly lower growth rate for gas. But the important line in this picture is the green line, which is the renewables. So renewable generation will increase by more than 40% over the medium term, uh, which will push up its, its uh, its share in global electricity generation from 23% today to about 28% in 2015. However, it is important to look at the, the, where this generation has come from and how it represents in terms of the decarbonization. When we did this analysis, we basically saw a two-speed world. Why do we call a two-speed world? Because the decarbonization pace will be different in different regions. So as you can see on the left-hand side of the, of the chart, uh, we basically draw electricity growth, which is the blue column, and the renewable generation growth over the medium term, which is the green one. 
As you can see in, in China, India, and Southeast Asian countries, renewables represent a portion of the electricity demand going forward. This doesn't mean that share of renewables is not going to increase in these countries. It's going, they are going to increase. However, it will be at a slower pace. When you look at the other side of the picture, European Union, United States, and Japan, renewable capacity generation growth will surpass that of the electricity demand, where the electricity demand is sluggish, which means that in these countries, we see a faster decar decarbonization of the electricity sector. Another important driver has been that everyone is talking about is the, is the costs. Uh, we basically look at the weighted average cost of renewables. We are weighting them according to how much we expect them to generate going forward. Uh, please don't mix things up with the expected uh, cost declines where several industry players are presenting. These are the projects that are fully commissioned and grid connected in these years. So in 2016 is an estimate in this case. So the largest cost reductions over the past years came from the solar PV, utilities case solar PV, and we expect another, on average, 25% uh, generation cost decline going forward. Why we expect this generation? First of all, the module market is oversupplied. We will see a significant continuous decline of module uh, prices in the coming three, four years. Um, and on the other hand, they represent only 30% of an investment of a solar PV system. So other 70% is coming from uh, balance of system costs, which we expect the largest cost reductions will happen. If you look at the average system costs in Japan and in, the, in China or India, uh, there's a significant difference in between them. Japan is almost double than the costs observed in India. And this is mainly due to uh, this balance of system costs and slightly due to the um, module costs. On the other hand, uh, onshore wind, we expect onshore wind generation costs to decline. As technology develops, we improve our capacity factors going forward. In many countries, we expect um, capacity factors to be higher uh, because of the new turbine technology, which will be deployed in many parts of the world. However, the largest cost reductions in terms of the percentage terms and in terms of the absolute terms we expect to come from offshore wind. This is a new technology in the United States. It has been mostly deployed in Europe. Europe, again, will do its job to reduce uh, cost of a technology as they did for onshore wind as well uh, and partly for solar PV uh, by paying a lot of money in the beginning. Uh, we expect this happen, the same thing to happen in offshore wind as well. We expect about 40% cost reduction over the coming five years. However, there is another new phenomenon going forward which are the tenders and auction results that you see, you hear from the news that every uh, week or every month uh, there is a new auction result which is announced, the lowest price, record price. And we see a significant transition from government set tariffs for renewables to competitive auctions. Uh, and, and we expect this trend to continue and the cost reductions also to follow that. But the most important thing what these auctions did is that it's first of all the price discovery as you can see now, uh, in coming two, three years, uh, some plants can come online in several parts of the world where resources are extremely good, and then the financing conditions are, are, are very, very good. You, you, will, you will be able to see uh, significantly low uh, project costs. However, one important caveat, some of these projects probably will not be realized. So these are the announced projects, or the price of these projects will probably be higher because of the increasing cost, especially in developing countries. However, this indicates a clear acceleration of the costs going forward. Another important thing what these auctions has achieved so far is the changing the risk perception of renewables. Why? Because instead of government setting the tariffs, you will see module producers, developers, other supply chain, uh, other, uh, supply chain uh, uh, players to come together with the banks and bid for these projects together. 
which means that the information about risks were basically spread out throughout the supply chain, which actually had an impact in terms of the changing perception of renewable risks. And we expect this to solidify going forward. When we look at the which technology uh, will be deployed more than the others, uh, over the past decade or two decades, hydropower uh, was responsible uh, for the significant capacity additions globally. However, this trend is going to change going forward. So hydropower, which was supporting renewable growth, will co in terms of new additions, will decline. This is mainly due to China, uh, for projects becoming more and more difficult and social and economic issues and environmental issues becoming more of a challenge, uh, especially for conventional projects or large-scale projects, in other words, we will see a decline in global additions. On the other hand, we expect a significant growth going forward for wind and solar PV and other technologies, the growth will remain stable. I would like to make an important point here that onshore wind and solar PV additions over the past were not smooth. It was full of boom and, boom and bust cycles due to policy changes. Uh, and this trend will continue over the medium term. And because most of the renewables will be deployed by policy incentives going forward, this does not necessarily mean that high economic incentives, but they will be supported by certain kind of policies on market frameworks. And changes to these policies will affect their deployment, which we saw in the past. US PTC and ITC extension for one year has affected boom and bust cycles in wind. We will see a record level installations in China this year alone. We expect 27 gigawatt of solar PV coming online in China because of a rush to, to get the higher feed-in tariffs. Uh, and we won't see probably this repeated in 2017. And we saw a significant boom in Japan, but the, the new regulation, we will see probably a slight bust in 2018, where our forecast shows. And for us, predicting these boom and bust cycles is the most difficult thing. Uh, it's, a, it's a big forecast uncertainty, and sometimes we cannot predict these boom and bust cycles. I'd like to look at certain important regions. So as I said, China remains the largest uh, market for renewables. It will remain the largest market. Each technology, for each important technology, China leads the growth. As you can see here, in hydropower, wind, and solar PV, China represents about 40% of all capacity additions globally. However, China, China's growth is not without challenges, obviously. Uh, there are significant challenges, especially on the grid integration side. China uh, curtailed about 15% of wind generation in 2015, about 12 to 13% of solar PV generation in 2015. Just to give you a comparison, this is the three times more electricity that is consumed in uh, Washington, D.C., or about the same in Connecticut. So we are talking about significant amount of power, which is basically curtailed, which is not used. And China is also facing another important issue, which is the overcapacity in the power market, because not only renewables uh, have been deployed very fast, also coal and nuclear, uh, will also be uh, installed very fast in China, while uh, power demand only grew by 0.5% in 2015 compared to on average 11% over the past two decades. So we will see a Chinese power generation slowing down, but the capacity continue to being built. What is the result of this? The result is very simple. We will, the curtailment remains a problem because in China, Coal power plants provide also heat needs during the winter, so they have to run to provide uh, heat uh, to several provinces. And when the demand is low and the wind and solar uh, resource is high, you will automatically see uh, curtailment on wind generation. China is trying to solve this problem by putting significant measures in place. However, we expect this, this, this challenge to continue to affect renewable deployment uh, going forward. United States, uh, so last year we 
forecasted this line, the black line, uh, and where we presented here in the United States, because of uh, PTC was expiring at the end of the year, and uh, 2016 we expected a record year, and then 2017 a dip. Uh, after the multi-year extension of PTC and ITC, um, we expect United States capacity growth to be 60% higher uh, than we forecasted last year overall. There is also an important forecast uncertainty here is the distributed generation uh, because it is the most difficult uh, segment uh, to forecast in the United States because there are a lot of challenges between utilities and, um, and developers and uh, residential users. Uh, and it, is, it can boom very fast, but it can also stagnate uh, if those challenges are not resolved. Uh, we expect about uh, 50 to 60 percent of new U.S. capacity to come from utility scale projects and the rest from residential and commercial. Uh, on the other hand, other technologies will suffer a little bit because they didn't get a multi-year tax extension, such as bioenergy, uh, geothermal, uh, uh, will, will a little bit suffer. Europe, the old growth story, the fastest runner of the marathon over the last five, ten years, but it will slow down. Uh, this is one of the reasons why uh, European editions overall are declining, uh, because Europe is in an overcapacity situation. The power demand is not growing because of the efficiency measure and macroeconomic conditions. And Europe saw a significant peak in 2011 in many countries such as Italy, Germany, uh, France, and UK later on with higher incentives. However, over the past two years, all these incentives to renewables were taken away, uh, and we will see a slower go growth going forward. The only country where the growth will slightly increase is France. Uh, the reason is very, very simple. The fr France is behind its 2020 targets in the uh, at the European Union level. Uh, another reason, they passed a new law and they put together a clear capacity expansion uh, through tenders on solar PV, uh, which will continue to be built uh, going forward, which gives a good signal. However, one important point on European Union is that there is a pending legislation at the EU level on 2030 targets, which actually gives us policy uncertainty for the growth of renewables, because there is an issue still pending legislation on the governance of these targets at the country level, and there is also um, there is also several uh, market integration um, uh, market integration legislations which are pending. So this affects our forecast. India, we do not expect. India to reach its solar PV target by 2022 in our, for, in our main forecast. India's story in 2009 was that cumulative capacity was dominated by hydropower. In 2015, we saw a significant growth of wind and again hydropower, but solar PV was minuscule almost. Over the medium term, we expect this picture to change. We expect majority of additions in India to come from solar PV. There are two drivers for this. One is the cost reduction. The second one is the, um, is the auctions that are held uh, at the both federal and state level. However, this growth is, not, is with challenges, obviously. That's why we do not expect India to reach its, its 2022 goal. Uh, financial health of utilities remain an, a challenge. Uh, increasing the off-taker risks uh, in auctions. Um, and there is also a, a pace of implementation of federal level incentive at the state level uh, due to also off-taker challenges, uh, such as uh, renewable portfolio obligations for solar PV, which are falling behind in, in, in certain states. Also, the grid remains weak uh, overall to absorb the the renewable expansion. However, there is a big black box in India, which is the distributed generation again. Overall, uh, residential and commercial uh, expansion is a black box in our forecast. Why? Because it can go really fast, but it's not uh, taken off yet in very important countries such as India and China. If those countries start deploying distributed generation, our forecast probably will be improved significantly. 
Latin America, another important region for renewables. Uh, over the past year, uh, capacity additions on renewables were mostly came from hydropower uh, by, and bioenergy. Uh, wind represented uh, uh, some portion of it, and solar PV was almost inexistent. Uh, this region has one of the best resources for solar PV and wind. Uh, capacity factors for onshore wind can go up to 50% in some of the places in Latin America. Uh, and for solar PV, the best resource globally is in Chile, uh, which will continue to deploy, which also has the lowest solar PV contract so far, uh, $29 uh, last year. Um, over the medium term, the driver, uh, as I mentioned in one of the pillars that I was talking about, uh, in the beginning of my presentation is actually diversification and energy security. These countries are either dependent on hydropower during the drought periods they suffer, or they are dependent on expensive imported natural gas. And they are trying to use non-hydro renewables to diversify their energy portfolio as other fossil fuel options are extremely expensive. Renewables in this region are mostly cheaper than fossil fuel alternatives. Um, we expect large-scale hydropower to continue, but at a slower pace. Uh, our forecast is actually overall on hydropower is lower uh, in this region. Uh, and also, we, all, we are also less optimistic in the growth of other technologies compared to last year. This is due to the current macroeconomic conditions, especially in Brazil, where several projects are facing significant financing challenges. Middle East and North Africa, one of the greatest potentials for solar PV and wind and hydro in Africa. However, the challenges remain to unlock this potential. What is the driver for renewables in these countries? There are two main drivers. Demand is growing. Also, they are looking for diversification from fossil fuels uh, or from hydropower. So, over the medium term, we expect three times more capacity that the region deployed over the past six years. Why is that? Because most of the capacity growth will come from auctions. And this region also has one of the lowest prices globally for several renewables. Hydropower remained the largest capacity addition uh, over the medium term, mostly in Africa, not in the Middle East. The main driver for hydropower is also the interconnection opportunities between countries where they can sell, install hydropower plants and sell uh, regionally in Africa. One of the most important future in, this, in these two regions will come from uh, either state-owned uh, EPC contracts for renewables or in countries where it is allowed, uh, independent power producers will bid uh, to basically uh, to provide wind and solar PV generation. This region will also see one of the largest growth on solar thermal electricity, especially in the Middle East. Um, however, as I said, these two regions are underperforming uh, compared to their, uh, compared to their uh, potential. Uh, our accelerated case actually expect about 60% more capacity growth. Uh, few challenges related to financing, uh, off-taker risks, and also grid integration uh, issues will help uh, to deploy to unlock the 60% additional growth. Overall, our forecast annual additions remain basically almost flat. There's a slight decrease in 2016 and 17 due to the bus cycle that we expect, and it will slightly uh, grow up. Our forecast is in line with INDCs, or now NDCs, that are submitted uh, for 2030. However, these NDCs do not take us to long-term climate goals that we agreed in Paris last year. According to our estimations, if we deploy all the INDC commitments, uh, we will, the temperature increase globally will be about 2.7 degrees, while we are we signed for two degrees and well below two degrees last year in Paris. However, as I said, several challenges that I mentioned, we also see that the, this main case is not the only story. Our accelerated case, which is basically explained in detail in the, in the book, 
sees that the growth, growing annual additions is possible, and uh, about 200 gigawatts in 2020. And, but this, is, this requires the three major challenges to be addressed. As I repeatedly say during my presentation, first, there are still a lot of policy uncertainties in too many countries. Uh, these policy uncertainties, if we deal with them, we will see higher growth. Financing challenging, challenges, especially in developing countries, and grid integration. Grid integration is a global challenge. Uh, it's all, it holds true for both developed countries and developing countries. Uh, and uh, there is, it's one of the challenges that if it's addressed in coming uh, two years uh, in a cost-effective way, we will see a higher uh, deployment. However, electricity tells you only one part of the story. It is the most popular one, most fashionable one, most supported one. However, renewables in road transport and heat sectors are falling behind, which if we want to go towards the climate goals that we want to achieve, we need those two sectors uh, to, to be decarbonized. Why these sectors are falling behind? Because they are different than electricity. It's not as simple as you supply, you build a power plant, you supply electricity, and then your electricity is dispatched. We are talking about a sector in, in the heat case where you have an extremely diversified portfolio. You have industrial consumers. You have buildings consumers, which are based on overall consumer choice. And uh, the cost of renewables remain high compared to fossil fuels, especially in low fossil fuel prices in, uh, in, the, in the heat sector. But the, another important thing is that consumer choice or industrial choice plays a role. When your, electric bo when your uh, oil boiler or gas boiler is broken, uh, you are in an emergency situation. So we have a consumer behavior, uh, uh, consumer behavior part which is playing an important role. You, you are not informed about renewable energy options. You just go and do the most easiest thing. This is why most of the people do that. The fact that it's diversified and economic and non-economic barriers remain in this sector, we will see a slower growth. And fossil fuel prices, like low fossil fuel prices, has an impact, especially in sectors, in market segments, where renewable options are directly competing with oil uh, and gas options. Over the medium term, bioenergy remains the largest source of the renewable heat. Uh, when I'm saying bioenergy, this doesn't include traditional biomass. It's only the modern renewable uh, uh, energy. And however, the, the growth rates in terms of the scaling up, we expect solar thermal and geothermal to move fast. And let's don't forget, when I said that we should decarbonize heat, the footnote says it very clearly. Heat accounts for 55% of final energy consumption and 38% of global CO2 emissions. Uh, which is extremely important to decarbonize if you want to achieve long-term targets. Biofuels, uh, we have a forecast on biofuels. Um, so United States, over the past six years, in terms of the production growth, was the leader globally, followed by Brazil, European Union, and Asia. However, we expect this picture to change significantly. The growth in the U.S. slows down. The ethanol production will remain flat. Most of the ethanol capacity in the U.S. is... Is at, the, is, is, is at the higher capacity factors, is operating at the higher capacity factors, and it's almost at the blending wall uh, at 10%. Um, and the infrastructure basically to, to scale this up uh, remains a challenge. Uh, and on the other hand, in the EU, we will see a slower growth. Um, most of the growth will come from uh, mainly uh, to uh, biodiesel, uh, plants which are not operating at, the, at their uh, highest level, so we expect their operation to uh, the capacity factors to increase. However, new capacity, attracting investment in new capacity, which is a long-term investment, is, remains challenging, especially at the low fossil fuel prices. On the other hand, you will see that the, the relationship between low fossil fuel prices and biofuels are not that straightforward, because under 
low fossil fuel prices, countries in Asia, such as Thailand, Malaysia, and India, had actually increased their mandates and policy support. The reason is very simple. Going back to my three main pillars is the energy security issues. These countries became an energy dependent uh, since 2013. They are mostly importing oil, and they want to diversify and improve their energy security. This is the main reason why they, we will see a stronger growth in Asia. Some conclusions. So we improved our forecast. Uh, this is mainly driven by policy improvements in three, four markets, such as US, China, India, and Mexico. And cost reductions obviously contributed to this. Uh, and in certain regions, uh, improving air quality is the major driver, especially in Southeast Asia and China and India. The impact of lower fuel, fuel prices is a complex dynamic. On the electricity side, we saw a little impact. The reason is very simple, because they are mostly sheltered by policies. Right now, around 145 to 150 countries have support schemes for some kind of a renewable electricity. However, biofuel and heat sectors are falling behind of our two degrees targets. The only two technology in the overall renewable energy field, which is in track, is solar PV and onshore wind. The important point of Asia, why we, we emphasize Asia a lot, is that if we want to decarbonize the electricity sector, uh, the competition between coal and gas and renewables in Asia remains very important. If Asia decarbonizes, globally we decarbonize faster, because most of the generation in Asia remains coal-based. Renewables policies will remain a significant factor going forward. However, as I said, this doesn't mean that we are talking about economic support. Their costs are more or less comparable with fossil fuel alternatives, but they require market frameworks that give them long-term investment uh, signals. Uh, particularly in markets where electricity demand will be slow, it's a challenge uh, to add new capacity. As I said, in many countries, the major challenge remains grid integration and technology improvement. Uh, and we basically work at the IEA. We have a new unit at the IEA who is working on grid integration. And uh, it's an important challenge to be met going forward. Thank you very much. For those listening on podcast, I'm David Sandalo at the Center on Global Energy Policy. I'm here with Amy Bahar from the International Energy Agency talking about IEA's medium-term renewable energy market report. Um, maybe there was a lot of data in that presentation. Could you just say a word to lay a foundation for us about where the IEA collects its data and how it does that? Sure. Um, so this is a forecast. It's not a scenario. So which means that there are no inputs and a model that is running and building renewable capacity. It's based on project pipelines. It's based on uh, targets. Uh, and we collect this project pipeline from various, uh, various internal and external uh, sources. And then we look at the policies, and we look at the challenges. And uh, we basically try to assess uh, how, how much of this capacity that is in the pipeline can, come, can become operational over the medium term. And our job is becoming more and more difficult because many countries uh, introduced auction schemes and they are auctioning off a certain capacity, which is easier to track. We have, in many countries, the tracking of these auctions. However, it is difficult to assess when they will come online. So this is the this is a forecast uncertainty overall. But it's based on real project market data. Uh, which we are, which is combined with uh, drivers such as costs and challenges, which we assess how much of this capacity will be deployed. You made an interesting point in your presentation about the sensitivity of these forecasts to policy decisions in, in, in many cases. So, so are, are there big instances in which some policy three or four years out might significantly change the direction of the forecast? Yes, uh, we saw this uh, in our previous forecasts. Uh, so the the. the the most important thing to highlight here, we do not imagine new policies in our forecast. So we just look at whatever is existing currently, 
in the countries and what challenges we have. And then with this existing policies, how much capacity will be deployed? This is our main case. In our accelerated case, we do not, again, imagine new policies. We do not say that China's new targets will be X gigawatts. However, we say that these are the challenges that prevents that capacity to be online in the main case, but we include that capacity in the accelerated case. What we saw is that in Europe, for instance, we had a sustainable forecast uh, two, three years ago. After the significant policy changes, we had to significantly uh, change our forecast and cut the capacity. Few examples, Spain changed their uh, renewable policy uh, retroactively. Uh, Romania changed it. UK just slashed after the 2015 boom uh, its uh, incentives to renewables. So, and we had to change our forecast. The same thing we did for the United States. We moved up our forecast by 60% because of the multi-year tax extension. But certainly one of the headlines of your presentation for a U.S. audience is that the growth in U.S. renewable capacity surpassed the growth in European renewable capacity uh, last year. Um, and, and do you project that to continue then for the next, uh, for the period ahead? And could you say a word about that? So actually, in the future, United States will surpass ah, the year. So not in 2015? 2015, uh, no. 2015 okay. was still lower. Okay. But in the future, in terms of the growth, U.S., for the first time, will ah. surpass, in terms of the five-year growth, will surpass the European Union. I see. Yeah. Got it. Um, it, it's a specific factual question. Um, of the existing renewable capacity in the world, how much is in different types of renewables? How much is in hydro? How much is in wind? How much is in solar? So in terms of capacity, still uh, hydro represents the majority. But capacity is one indicator. I think it's better to talk about generation. Mm -hmm. uh, in overall renewable generation, hydropower represents about 71.2% of overall renewable generation. Uh, solar PV represents about 2 to 3%, if I, I remember correctly. Uh, wind is about 7%, and bioenergy and others represent the rest. However, in 2021, share of hydropower in overall renewable capacity will decline from 71% to 59%. Uh, and who will take the, this share? Uh, mostly solar PV and wind. Um, you had some very interesting data on costs. Um, there was one slide that surprised me. I don't know if we could pull it up. It may be hard, but I, the way I, I saw it, it looked like you were projecting a slowdown in the decline of solar PV costs. They're very you know, high solar PV costs in 2011. They've come down a lot now, but your projection in 2021 yeah. was for a relatively small decline. Um, wh why is that? The reason is very simple, is the balance of system costs, which are more sticky to decline. So uh, it's easier to guess how modules will module cost will decline. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, as I mentioned, there's an overcapacity in the module market. There's also an overcapacity in the uh, turbine market uh, currently. Uh, so, but the, the part which is the other 70 to 80 percent in some cases uh, includes regulatory measures, financing rates, uh, monetization of the tax incentives, uh, other equipments, installation costs, which are completely different and which are very, very market specific. So what we do in order to understand the future costs, we divide module costs and we use a learning rate for the model cost, which is different than the balance of system costs. So we divide it with the local currency, the system costs into two, model costs and balance of system costs, and we try to estimate them separately, then we put them back together. We've been working hard in the United States to reduce our balance of system costs. It's a challenge. Um, do you have any thoughts on that, on, on what the United States could do to reduce balance of system costs? So United States is one of the most complicated markets in terms of the balance of system costs. It's one of the highest in the world. Um, it is not really my expertise in detail, very in detail. But the only thing that, that I know um, that there are few companies in the United States, uh, and some of the, at the utility scale, for instance, uh, costs are related to land, 
uh, costs are related to our several other installation and financing schemes. And another important thing to note that monetizing tax incentives is relatively more expensive than, than for instance, financing a feed-in tariff. Uh, and financing rates is a little bit uh, uh, an important uh, part of this overall uh, system costs. Uh, however, this on the positive side, which means that there's a lot of room for improvement in the United States uh, compared to Germany, for instance. Uh, and I think, uh, and I think the, uh, the market is going, will go towards that direction. And it's also sometimes United States costs are high because of the lag between the contracting of those projects, which means some of the utility scale projects were contracted four or five years ago with higher costs, mm. and they are coming online today. And our data looks at projects that are only coming online today, which also represents projects that are contracted three, four years ago, obviously, yeah. You, you talked, you emphasized China and its dominant role uh, in, in, in this marketplace. What are your assumptions about Chinese um, economic growth going forward? Um, economic growth is one part, uh, the only number that I remember is the electricity demand growth, which is an indicator. Uh -huh. uh, we expect electricity demand growth to be about 3.5% going forward in the coming five years. And Chinese 13 five-year plan, if I remember correctly, uh, expects about 4 to 5% uh, GDP growth uh, going forward in the coming five years. But this doesn't mean that it's a slower economic growth. I mean, obviously, in terms of numbers, it's a slower economic growth. But it's also China is also implementing incredible efficiency measures, which has a direct impact on the electricity demand growth. Uh, investment in efficiency in China uh, was the highest as well last year uh, among any other uh, countries. In, in power generation efficiency? In yeah. industry, yeah. In, the, in, in all efficiency measures. Yeah. Uh, China is moving towards a different kind of economy which was based on hardcore uh, energy intensive manufacturing. The goal is to move slowly from energy intensive manufacturing to, uh, to more value based uh, service sector. And I think in the five years we will see uh, certain impacts of this. There's often discussion about Chinese data and where it comes from and the quality of, of, of the data. Um, how, how does IEA get its data about Chinese energy? So all the data that we are using uh, is coming from the government sources in our, uh, in our forecast. So uh, IEA is a big uh, uh, checks and balance uh, system to collect the data, look at the data, and uh, check it, and go back uh, and forth with the governments to, uh, to basically validate it. Uh, so this is our statistics uh, department who is doing that for every single country uh, in the world, uh, most of the countries in the world, not all of them right now, but our data is coming uh, from the government data, which is revised up and down historically as well, uh, uh, which we also have to revise down our data uh, up and down based on that. <laughs> Uh, so you did a great tour of the world in your presentation. Maybe just I'll do another quick tour of the world, just to ask you some questions that were occurring to me as you spoke. So uh, you highlighted India as also an important growth market, in, and uh, you're skeptical about the Indian government's ability to meet its uh, its solar targets. Do you? What are the specific barriers, and um, are, are there any are there thoughts about how those might be overcome? Uh, India is implementing right policies. Don't get me wrong. I think India is is implementing the right policies to achieve this target. However, we are talking about really in six, seven year period, a growth which is extremely high level uh, and uh, uh, solar PV1. Our forecast for onshore wind and hydropower is in line with the growth that the Indian government expects. But solar PV, uh, the challenges remain in terms of the uh, renewable portfolio standards and the state level implementation of these standards has been a challenge. Some of the auctions have resulted in, uh, in very low prices. However, uh, some of the off-takers at the state level with their uh, financial situation, uh, they do not want to take these contracts. So it's one of the main, there's also land uh, acquisition challenges in India and it's an overall challenge, not only for renewables. 
which we expect to, to slow down the growth. Uh, but the Indian government is taking really the right steps to improve the financial health of utilities, I think which will be the key factor to change our forecast. Uh, it introduced several, uh, several policies to make this uh, financial ability of, uh, uh, of financial health of utilities better. And I think if these policies are implemented correctly, this one of these is Udai uh, system where uh, to improve their balance sheets. If it's improved, I think uh, we will change our forecast next year. Um, and the Middle East, um, there has been a move in Saudi Arabia to uh, scale up solar power. What's your assessment of, of how that's going and the forecast? So I don't remember the exact numbers of Saudi Arabia forecast, uh, but most of these countries are based on opening up a tender, uh, getting the prices. However, after that, we observed delays in the implementation of this. Mm. So uh, there is big news uh, that everyone reads uh, online that uh, Saudi Arabia contracted X or any other Middle Eastern country contracted X. However, when we move to financing of those projects uh, and the implementation of those projects, usually these countries have uh, several challenges. Uh, but its upside is significantly high, as I said in my presentation. So we are a little bit conservative uh, in our main case, uh, but probably uh, more capacity will be deployed in, in our accelerated case. And, and jumping over to Latin America, I wondered um, when you spoke about the Caribbean, and, and uh, there's been discussion of, of the islands in the Caribbean that currently rely upon diesel fuel, expensive diesel fuel, um, transitioning towards greater reliance on renewables. Is that something you looked at and do you expect? Have an assessment there? This is not uh, this. This is not our focus. So uh, I'm, okay. we don't. We have 48 focus countries, uh -huh. and we look at other countries in a less detailed way. Uh -huh. So uh, the, the Caribbean region is not a region that we look at uh, in very detailed. Uh, well, I have a few more questions before we throw it open uh, to the crowd. For those who are listening on podcast, um, I'm David Sandalow. I'm here with Jaime Bahar from the International Energy Agency, talking about renewable energy. Um, you had a very interesting discussion of renewable heat, and I thought maybe just uh, that doesn't get much attention, like you said. Could you just kind of lay the foundation and, and say what, what technologies are you talking about with renewable heat? So we are talking about, uh, so as I said, about 150 countries have renewable electricity policies, and for heat, this number is about half. Uh, so, and heat is mostly deployed in the European Union, uh, European Union countries have uh, 2020 targets, which includes electricity, heat, and transport. Uh, and several countries introduced very, very specific policies, such as in the UK, such as in the Germany, uh, to basically deploy heat. Uh, and about 80%, sorry, 90% of uh, heat output, renewable heat output, is coming from modern Maya energy, which means uh, bioenergy. Bio -energy, exactly, but uh, not traditional biomass like modern bioenergy, like pellets, like uh, uh, all these other t uh, inputs. Uh, we do not consider traditional biomass as renewables because it's, uh, it's, it's polluting. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's burning, it's dangerous for the health. So, um, and, uh, and the other part is coming from solar thermal, which is, uh, which is actually an important data. Current solar thermal water heating capacity globally is double than the solar PV capacity. So it is, it is really, really widely used globally. Uh, in the United States, for instance, for, for water, he uh, water heating in the pools, it is used widely. In, in China, uh, a lot of people are using solar thermal. In Turkey and in southern part of Europe, uh, solar thermal water heating is, is widely used. Uh, and another one is geothermal, which is very, very small at this point, uh, but it will scale up fast from a, from a small base. Uh, and also, we also look at the electricity part of this, which means that some of the appliances at your home is producing heat but using electricity. And more and more, the, in, the share of renewables in electricity increases, we will see the share of heat or heat output with the renewables increasing in the, in the electricity sector also. Uh, affecting that heat renewable output. So we also take that into account as well. We separate both direct use of heat 
an indirect use of heat uh, producing electricity. And so when you see growth in the market, is, is that growth in solar hot water heaters or, or other technology segments? Or? So we expect bioenergy over the coming five years to grow by about 15 percent. Uh, for solar thermal, it's about, I think, 60 percent. I have it in my notes. I can't remember all the numbers by heart. Um, You've done a pretty good job so far. Yeah, <laughs> I think solar thermal uh, about 50% or 40% and geothermal about 60%. So, uh -huh. they w But we are talking about very small, very uh, starting on a very small base, yeah. I think just elaborate on that distinction you referred to earlier, how the IEA distinguishes between what pellets and biofuels. What, what did you mean by that in terms of what's considered to be biofuel and what isn't? Huh? Biofuels, we are... Biofuels include ethanol and biodiesel uh -huh. on the transport side, uh, and on the on the on the bioenergy side, you have agriculture residues, you have waste, uh -huh. you have renewable waste, uh -huh. uh, you have uh, pallets, uh, and so on and so forth. Traditional biomass is out of this. Uh, we don't consider we call them modern renewables. Yeah. Okay. Let me uh, invite anybody who'd like to ask a question. We have a microphone up here. Um, Please come to the microphone. Hi, thanks for your presentation. My name is uh, Jonathan DeSeggi. I'm a student here at Columbia studying energy. My question has to do with uh, the challenges of renewables and grid integration. And you hear a lot about zombie grids and the you know issues with subsidies and a broken business model that's leading to many issues in usually you read about the US and uh, the European Union. My question is, outside of the US and the EU, are these same grid integration problems occurring in developing countries? And the reason why I ask that is, in telecoms you sort of saw a leapfrogging of new technologies in some developing countries that eliminated some of that friction. So my question is, is it different uh, outside of the, the developed world in terms of response to the grid and renewables and figuring out this new world? Thank you. So the, the, the problem in developing countries, or the challenge, let's say, is actually electrification. So uh, before going into renewables, uh, the grid has to improve in order to electrify uh, millions of millions of people uh, going forward. So uh, the problems are, are usually different. In developed countries, we see the integration uh, of high levels of uh, renewables into the electricity system, such as in Germany, such as in, uh, in the UK, we will see in France. This is the operational discussion, how we can integrate high shares of renewables. On the other hand, in developing countries, uh, and also emerging economies, one challenge is to extend grid to connect renewables. So in China, uh, there are some installed capacity, installed wind turbines, but they are not connected to the grid. So there's a delay in terms of catching up uh, with the connection of renewables. And, and in terms of leapfrogging, uh, there are a lot of discussion about uh, how off-grid options uh, can contribute to the electrification in the developing world. Uh, there's a lot of momentum on this uh, going on right now with pay-as-you-go systems uh, in, in Africa. Uh, but we are talking about very small capacity. Our report is not focusing that much on that part. But there's a movement there, how renewables, especially solar PV, can contribute to the electrification of this. Uh, but up to 10% of, of uh, renewable penetration into the electricity grid. Our previous study showed that in a country where the operation of grid is done uh, in a, in a, in a uh, how do you say, in an operational manner by the transmission system operator in a, in a scheduled way, uh, it, shouldn't close, uh, it, sh it shouldn't cause a lot of problems. However, uh, we are talking about in developing countries the weak infrastructure and operation which is weak. Uh, so there needs to be an improvement on both sides, both on the operation side and on the infrastructure side. But it will remain the most important, uh, uh, I will say, challenge uh, going forward, uh, which is equally important in both developed countries and developing countries. 
If anyone else has questions, please come to the microphone. In the meantime, I have a couple of questions about auctions, which you spoke, had some very interesting data on, on auctions. First, I wonder, is, is there a, does the IEA maintain a database on all the renewable auctions that are happening in the world right now? And, that it has, and, um, and, and then second, um, there's, there's been discussion of how um, their auctions invite low bids, and sometimes the bidders may not have the capacity to follow through on the bids. And there's been concern about structuring auctions to prevent that type of risk. Is the IEA collecting data on follow through from these bids and, and any potential, you know, any, any failure rates associated with these auctions? Very good question. Yes, we have uh, a, a database that we are trying to keep. Uh, uh, although it is difficult to collect information on these auctions. It is easy to collect the price information, but it is difficult to collect what this price includes. Uh, so for instance, in several countries, these prices may include a land subsidy, may include grid uh, connection, or may not include grid connection. So we are trying to call uh, our contacts in both private and public sector in order to understand what is the adjustment of this price that is announced in terms of if there's uh, additional subsidies, if there are uh, subsidized financing involved. So that's the, that's the biggest problem. We also follow up projects which are not commissioned or which will never commission. Those that, are, that I showed in the, in the, in the chart, uh, those we expect that it will commission in coming years. Uh, we will have to take out the Brazil $80 bid from that because most of these projects will not be financed and probably will not be built. Uh, we basically took out the UK solar uh, auction which happened in two years ago and which will never be built. Um, however, uh, it's also difficult to predict the delays because you have an auction, for instance, in South Africa uh, and uh, then uh, the South African utility uh, is not able to connect those plants, so you have a delays. So we are trying to follow all these details, mm -hmm. but overall the challenge is not to follow up if the co uh, project is commissioned or not. In my opinion, is to find out what does that price include. Because without understanding that, everyone, we cannot understand why this auction is, was successful or not. Uh, that's the most important point that we are trying to get. Because now everyone wants to do auctions, right? So because when you, a country, a politician, sees that, oh my God, Chile contracted $30 uh, uh, solar PV plant, we have to do this as well. But it's not that easy. It was easy to set a feed-in tariff. Uh, to be, it's just one price and then you buy. Uh, but it is, difficult, it is more difficult to design an auction. Well, maybe just a, a few final questions. Um, uh, so first, we have coming up, I think, starting, uh, starting next week, the uh, 22nd Conference of Parties, the Framework Convention the f in, in Marrakesh, Morocco, following up on Paris. Um, are, are, are you looking for anything out of that meeting related to renewables, or do you th how do you think the whole Paris process is affecting um, the growth of renewables? So the, the Paris process, uh, actually led us to improve our forecast. I mean, not particularly, but policies around the Paris process, before and after. Um, what is missing at this point, it has been a great achievement, and ratification is way faster than Kyoto Protocol. But, uh, but there, is also a lot of, um, uh, there is also a lot of points about the financing mechanisms around it that will be discussed in Marrakesh the governance structure of INDCs, how it will be governed in terms of uh, uh, how countries will follow up on those, uh, how, um, how every five years uh, there is a procedure to submit a new INDC to improve the INDCs, uh, how uh, UNFCCC will, uh, will follow up on the track, the progress. These are all the questions uh, that, that I think will be answered uh, not only in Marrakesh, but in coming COPs, uh, I think up to 2019, because uh, the starting point, if I remember correctly, is 2020. Uh, yeah. Well, if anybody has any final questions, um, please come to the microphone. Um, and if I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close with a career question for you. I mean, so <laughs> career advice for our graduates. Yeah. Hi, thank you very much for your presentation again. Um, I was wondering, I think the Paris Agreement 
is a lot of positive. Um, I was wondering what the role is of private capital in the further decarbonization of the energy sector, what the major hurdles are that you see and how to overcome them. So the, so probably six, seven years ago, uh, the corporates were investing in renewables for corporate social responsibility reasons. Uh, now this is changing. Uh, in the United States, uh, half of uh, wind PPAs that are signed uh, in 2015 were by corporates. And they are not doing this for corporate social responsibilities. They are either buying renewable power uh, because it's actually with current incentive schemes is, is competitive uh, with certain fossil fuel alternatives. Uh, or uh, they are basically investing in it in an equity uh, because it's becoming more, uh, uh, it, they will get a re decent return on it. So that's the first part. Uh, the missing finance, uh, the important thing here, the, to, how do we finance uh, two degree scenario, right, overall? Who is going to give all this money? So we saw a significant improvement in green bond issuance by the private sectors. Obviously the governance, governance of these green bonds will be will be developed over time that to make sure that these projects actually, this money that is uh, collected will be invested in, in renewables. So there's a lot of work going on on that. However, uh, in order to achieve those level of financing, uh, we need certain liquidity uh, in a market. So we have an oil and gas market, which is extremely liquid with a lot of financial, financial products, but on renewables, we don't have this right now. So the development of this will come when banks and financial institutions are involved more and more into these projects. And I am sure probably it will come from the United States, these products mm. uh, going forward and how we can create more liquid products which will basically hedge uh, certain risks uh, in the renewable uh, expansion. So that's, that is very important. As, as the corporates will play an important role in this. By the way, you refer to the two degree C target. Um, here in the United States, we actually think in degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah. Uh, I'm, just, I'm curious, looking out at the audience, how many people in this audience feel that they are confident they can convert degrees centigrade to degrees Fahrenheit, just out of curiosity? So, okay, so, so let the record show here at Columbia University uh, in a crowd that was interested in climate and energy, I'd say about 25% of the people raised their hand. That the answer, by the way, is that two degrees centigrade is equal to 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit. So when you talk about two degrees C to an American audience, it kind of cuts the problem down by half. <laughs> it's interesting. So, so maybe as a, as a friendly recommendation to the IEA, when you bring your slides to the US, sure. you could put Very degrees good Fahrenheit. Yeah. We no. should, uh, <laughs> that, that was a protest from a Columbia professor who's deeply <laughs> familiar with degrees centigrade, <laughs> unlike most of the population professors. So we can have a conversation about this later. Uh, uh, sir. My, my question was on uh, Chinese dominance uh, in, in renewable energies. I wonder, this is for, I'm sure, strategic purposes, what kind of uh, signaling does this have to the other countries in the Southeast Asian region? And uh, given whatever signals, uh, will they be able to kind of follow suit or learn from, from China's example? So the, the Southeast, this is the only region that I did not present because of the time purposes, Southeast Asia. Uh, but our air pollution study, which we released a few months ago, uh, showed uh, how many people are dying prematurely from air pollution and how much of the power sector is responsible for it. And the numbers were extremely significant. Um, and when you go to that region, uh, climate change mitigation is important, but for social reasons, air pollution and, and how air pollution creates in terms of health costs in the society is, is, is really, really the main driver. And in Southeast Asia, uh, this is the region where coal will continue to be the, the cheapest source of electricity generation. Uh, and uh, renewables are expensive there because they are not scaling up very fast. Uh, countries introduce, and there are also fossil fuel subsidies in this region. So renewables, uh, both the fossil fuel subsidy reform 
uh, and renewable uh, policies uh, were uh, announced in this region at the same time uh, where the countries are trying to uh, basically move towards uh, a cleaner air uh, and uh, a more sustainable development. But in reality, uh, the coal remains uh, a, a big industry in this region. Uh, but another important factor that is coming into play, which we shouldn't forget, these, these countries in the Southeast Asia were energy exporters. Now they, are, they have become energy importers. So there's an energy security kick that is uh, coming into play as well. So I think the combination of these, of these, uh, of these uh, factors uh, will play an important role. And of course, the policymakers are also afraid of the cost of renewables, because the previous examples showed that many people paid a lot of money to renewables, and it affects the budget. But the important hook here, the money that is saved on fossil fuel subsidies, how it can be used to renewables. Uh, going forward. Yes, yes. Uh, the, the, the distributed generation is important, but it also requires a certain regulatory infrastructure which is missing. The most of the challenge in this region in scaling renewables are administrative and regulatory issues between the policy and the regulation and administration. So uh, there is a feed-in tariff which is announced super high, but in some cases there is no deployment. The reason is very simple, because there is a regulatory and administrative issues which, are, which, which creates a deadlock in the deployment of renewables. If those are resolved, I think it will be a, it can grow very, very fast. Sir. Hi. Um, I read an article a bit ago. Oh, oh yeah. My name is Pablo Ruiz, and um, I'm a researcher um, for for um, uh, a startup hedge fund about that actually concentrates in energy, um, renewable energy. But anyway, um, I read an article about how um, a recent article about how uh, hydro, for example, the the CO2 emissions and other like uh, greenhouse emissions from these projects are actually much much higher than previously thought. Have you modeled these in your, in, your, um, in, your, in your models? Or have you put this data into the models? Or has that not been taken into account? We, in a medium term forecast, we do not look at the uh, emissions of, the, of the, okay. any power plants. Or, or it's just, it's just uh, this is a market forecast. But uh, IEA's other analysis uh, on technology and long term outlooks look at these issues. So I mean, I'm sorry, I cannot uh, oh, okay. uh, have uh, of my head uh, the, these things, but but overall, if you look at the trend, uh, we will see less uh, large scale hydropower plants to be built uh, globally. We will go towards a smaller scale uh, hydropower plants, and one important market segment that will grow as well is the pumped hydro storage. Okay, uh, because it is it it provides an important service to integrate renewable uh, energies because it's the most widespread and cheapest. Uh, storage option globally right now. Okay. Yeah. All right, thanks. So, hi, my name is Sean. I'm a visiting uh, researcher here at the CIPA. Um, I have uh, two questions for your um, report. Um, I'm sorry, I missed the first couple of minutes of your presentation, so I'm not sure if you already touched base on that. But I, I skimmed your um, executive summary. You mentioned about the future um, wind and then um, solar PV cost uh, will be. Uh, decreased to up to uh, $30 per megawatt or to $50 per megawatt. I was wondering, did you uh, incorporate into the connection to the grid cost into your uh, cost analysis? In other words, what is the capacity factor that you assume that for the, uh, the projects that you uh, will be deploying on the ground, what will sure. be the efficiency? Um, the second question sure. uh, is about, you mentioned that interesting um, data in terms of the renewable energy capacity in the, by 2021. Uh, will be increased from now to 23% uh, to 28% to 5% or more. I'm interested in your model in the, this 5% increase of the capacity. Uh, as we see, it will be replaced, well, it will replace uh, coal or say the fossil fuel capacity. But in your model, is this redu reduction of capacity a result of the existing capacity being phased out naturally or is it because of the competition that 
the renewable energy that beat out those coal capacity. In other words, this coal capacity will still remain running, but it's just because of the market competition that is being um, phased out to the market. So thank you. So very good and extremely complicated uh, two questions. Uh, the first one, um, so in our, uh, first of all, that 30 to $40 price is the auction results, which are not the commission projects. So they will be commissioned in coming two, three years, hopefully. We don't know. We will follow up uh, if they are commissioned at one price. Um, in some of the cases, these prices include grid connection. In some of the cases, they don't. Uh, in $30 Chile price, which is the cheapest, grid connection is included. And most of the uh, uh, numbers that we show uh, include grid connection. So, I mean, uh, there are some which we account for afterwards and we adjust because we want to show everything in, uh, in the total costs. Um, in terms of the capacity factors, so our model has looks at the historical performance of the existing fleet of every single renewable technology, including hydro, technology by technology. And then we are basically looking at for the future uh, how much of the capacity factor of the new fleet uh, uh, will be. Uh, for instance, taking into account the, the increasing uh, technology improvement of wind turbines. In our model, in some countries where the renewables are still uh, being deployed uh, now, uh, which means a new and not consolidated markets, we are using an increasing capacity factor for new plants going forward. So, so every single country has its own capacity factor and has its own improvement factor uh, in the new capacity additions. The second question is, this is not in our model, uh, but the important part is to look at the generation, not capacity. Obviously, capacity is extremely important, but it is very, very difficult to predict a plant, for instance, which is, uh, which is, uh, which is there, but just only works for uh, 50 hours a year. Do you count that power plant uh, dis displaced or not? <laughs> so it is actually displaced, but it's, all, it's, it's there. It's not decommissioned. So we are looking at, when we look at the capacity additions, we look at net capacity additions. Uh, and, uh, and in some regions, obviously, there will be a significant decommissioning of coal plants. Uh, and but also early retirement of gas plants in Europe, for instance. A uh, few years ago, the most efficient uh, CCGT gas plant in Germany was decommissioned after having operated only seven, eight years because the market uh, uh, is not giving the right signal to this gas uh, plant. So it is impossible to predict these, these decommissionings. Uh, but in our models, uh, in our fossil fuel models, we have a certain assumption of when the capacities are going to be decommissioned. Hi, my name is Anthony. I'm a researcher from a publishing company. And I just have a couple questions. The first one is a clarification on your statement that only solar PV and wind were on track to fulfill their two degrees Celsius um, goal. Is that based on the quota set by different countries' policies? And then second questions, I'm, wonder, I'm wondering if you could briefly comment on the design of three recent auctions that come to mind in Latin America, the one gigawatt one in Argentina now, and then the three gigawatt one in Mexico last month, and four gigawatt one in Chile in August. If you could com comment on their design compared to other ones. Sure. So in terms of the, um, uh, the first question was on uh, two degrees, yeah. So our long-term models uh, basically have a, a temperature increase constraint in the model, and they calculate, they look at the overall energy system, and then they say that renewable generation uh, in electricity, heat, and transport should reach those levels by 2020, 2030, 2040, 2050, and going forward. So in terms of terawatt hours, for instance. So 
We take that 2030 target, we look at 2030, our forecast is up to 2021. We look at the growth rates, we have a model that tracks that. We have a conservative approach if these growth rates continue the way that we expect, uh, in our main case, not in our accelerated case, uh, is this going to hit two degree scenario or not? On the INDC side, our World Energy Outlook colleagues modeled those, take into account all the INDCs and modeled it. This is how we track that as well, the same way. We look at the generation that we model from renewables uh, and output, and then we look at the 2030 target, we look at the growth rate in the past, and that we try to understand if we are in line or not. In this case, only solar PV and uh, onshore wind. Uh, we found out that they are in line with the 2 da targets. Uh, in terms of the auction uh, designs uh, and the, these low prices, uh, in Argentina, I don't know if you read yesterday, uh, there was an immediate, so in our, if you read the book, uh, in the Argentina section, uh, we talk about it's a great development. However, we basically warned what happened in 2009. Argentina launched an auction in 2009. Most of these capacity did not come online because of the financing reasons, because of the various reasons. Uh, Argentina put together a financing uh, fund to basically, it's called FODER, I think, uh, to finance all these projects. Uh, however, yesterday on the news, uh, it said that uh, there has been, that there might be some problems in the financing uh, in terms of, the, uh, of these projects. It's great achievement. Our forecast in the main case does not expect all this capacity that is standard to come online. Uh, uh, we expect a portion of it uh, because of the exactly the financing challenges in place. If those are addressed next year, probably we will improve our forecast, as simple as it is. In Mexico, Mexico is the most advanced auction scheme in the world right now in terms of uh, taking into account the grid integration of renewables. So if we are talking about a wholesale marginal cost market which exists all around the world, uh, if you include renewables which are zero marginal cost, this, this doesn't really work very well, right? So you need a, the, the wholesale markets that we have are designed to accommodate marginal cost generation, which is fossil fuels. So when you include zero marginal cost into a marginal cost market, you will automatically see that uh, the costs, overall average prices are decreasing. What Mexico did, gave two signals uh, to, uh, to, the, to the market. First signal was a locational signal. So the government announces locations where the prices are high, electricity prices are high, and opens a competition to attract investment to these specific locations, okay? This is the first part of the design. When you bid in a Mexican auction, you bid with a locational pricing. Afterwards, there is also an hourly adjustment of the prices, which is also very important, which gives the short-term price signal to renewables. If your generation doesn't make sense in that specific hour, which means that it doesn't contribute to the system, its value is lower. So they will adjust your generation according to this. It's a little bit complicated, but it's the right way of going, giving a locational signal and a temporal signal to renewables, which they require, to take into that the value. However, there was one problem. They, the locational adjustment in uh, Yucatan region, which is the place where it's not the sunniest, it's not the windiest, receive the majority of projects that, are, that will be installed there. Why? Because the electricity prices are high there. So government wants to take it down by attracting investment. However, grid infrastructure is not strong. So our forecast looked at this, and then we do not expect most of the capacity, sorry, a portion of the capacity not to be online in this region. Okay? But in other parts where NL Green Power, for instance, bid in the center of Mexico, those projects will come online, I think, no problem. In Chile, there is another problem. In Chile, the nodal pricing in different regions and those prices that are signed does not necessarily mean that the developer is going to receive that price. Because you sign a contract in Chile with 30, 15 or 20 different utilities. So you sign the PPA with the generation that you will provide includes 15 different utilities. But those utilities are located or might be located different than where you generate. 
So you are responsible for this price differential uh, going forward, which is a good thing. It gives a different price signals, but at the same time, it's a financing risk for a bank because that PPA, actually that price, is not going to be taken into account. So that's why we do not expect as well all the Chilean projects to come online. <laughs> Sorry, it was a long answer, but... Uh, well, yeah. Very informative <laughs> answer. Uh, thank you. So, so th uh, thank you, Jaime Bahar, for this fascinating yeah. presentation. There's um, one more question, I think. We're no, we're no we are... Oh, I'm sorry, we're out of time. We'll have to follow oh, up yeah. uh, uh, afterwards. And um, uh, I just want to close with a quick question, because I think a number of our graduates uh, may be listening today and thinking, I would love to have a job at the IEA working on renewable energy. Um, and. and not just for the opportunity to live in Paris, but also for the opportunity to work on these issues. And I just wonder, from, from your uh, career, uh, any advice for our, for our graduates who, who are interested in working in renewable energy broadly, what would you recommend they do? Um, very good question. Uh, so I feel extremely lucky, because whatever I learned uh, in the competitive competitor school, which is size in Johns Hopkins. Uh, I'm you overcame uh, that handicap. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but I think uh, CIPA has a similar program, so I, I think we can talk about the, uh, the same levels here. Um, I use day to day uh, in my uh, in my work life, which is which which is not very straightforward for some people, right? So I specifically chose to take renewable energy classes at SAIS. I specifically chose electricity market classes in, at SAIS. Uh, I didn't choose any coal classes. It was a particular choice. And I always wanted to work in, uh, in, this, uh, in this field. And, um, and IEA actually, the work at the IEA, actually goes very well with this kind of an education. Because uh, there are engineering at the IEA. There are engineers. There are uh, economists. And there are, uh, who, there are people who studied public policy. And the combination of these three is actually creating a, a great uh, uh, kind of a momentum uh, to analyze energy markets. Uh, and, uh, and I think it's a great place to work uh, as well. Uh, there are a lot of people from different backgrounds and different nationalities. Um, and there are a lot of opportunities. I mean, I think, uh, I think uh, public policy schools are in a good place to, to work at the at TIA. Well, thank you. Well, so this I encourage is, everyone to apply. <laughs> uh, this is uh, one of a number of great events that we're hosting here at the Center on Global Energy Policy. Uh, our upcoming events include uh, an event with Eric Warnes, the Statoil Stat Chief Economist, uh, on Wednesday, November 16th, um, uh, on Statoil's Energy Perspective, the 2016 edition. Um, today, please join me in thanking Jaime Bahar for a great presentation. Thank you very much.